Um, Gérard Garcanti, New York. I have a question for Suzanne and, and one for Clint. Uh, there must be a molecular basis to the interaction, to the effect of uh, load on bone. And it seems from at least one of studies or several studies have shown that there is the need for the sympathetic tone mm -hmm. to have a bone loss in, in uh, tail suspension mice and, and certainly in astronauts. And I was wondering if you have looked at this in your model. Should I ask a question to Clint now or after? <laughs> Go ahead, quick question. Yeah, to, that'd be fine. Okay, so first of all, Clint, uh, Rungs 2 came first, and then vibration affected bone. But without Rungs 2, there is no bone. So Rungs 2 came first, and vibration second. But that's not a question. <laughs> <laughs> No, <laughs> you made the comment that vibration came before rungs two, and I'm telling you to have bone, you need rungs two, and then vibration affects bone. It's not the other way around. But to go back to your to your to what you presented, uh, again the buzz is a stress on on the organism, and I was wondering if you have measured sympathetic tone because an increase in sympathetic tone will certainly explain the effect on insulin and fat that you see. You should, if you increase sympathetic tone, you should have less fat without necessarily affecting stem cells. So those are my two questions and my comment. Okay. 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 Um, I I'm glad you raised that question. I think it's a very important one. Um, yes, we have looked um, at the role of sympathetic tone. Um, we and others, I think in your lab as well, have shown that if you give um, propanolol um, to, in the drinking water, you can mitigate bone loss during hind limb unloading. So there must be some elevation of sympathetic tone um, in that condition, um, and it, which you are suppressing with propanolol. Um, but it's a complex question because uh, if you're thinking in the context, too, of um, um, exercise during periods of disuse, for example, you have some elevation, some acute elevation in sympathetic tone during an exercise bout, but typically with regular endurance exercise, at least, you would expect to see reduced sympathetic tone over the average uh, uh, time. So it's a complex question. And um, it gets, once you work with in vivo models, of course, it gets all the more complex. But well, I mean, it's you an can important it, issue. You can do it with mice like in one or two genes. It's, it can be done in vivo. Mm -hmm. Right. But, but I, as, as an exercise science person, I'm also very interested in what's the independent effect of, of changes in sympathetic tone, acute sy changes in sympathetic tone, and or the impact of regular exercise bouts on overall sympathetic tone, which may be layered on onto the top of all those regulatory pathways that your laboratory has elegantly described in, in the role of um, um, leptin and via the hypothalamus on sympathetic tone. I should leave Clint some time to answer. I forgot the question. <laughs> the question is, have you looked if the buzz is a stress that affects the sympathetic tone and an increase in sympathetic tone will explain the metabolic effect that you see? So, so I, I guess I would answer it by suggesting that what we're seeing is not a metabolic response but a developmental response. I mean, you're sort of wondering about sort of the role of stem cells in it. No, I'm not. I'm just asking if you have measured sympathetic tone. No. Okay. Question. Technically, uh, uh, Karasek Boston, uh, Gerard already took uh, part of my question. So uh, my animal behavior colleagues uh, use the hind limb unloading uh, as a model of acute stress. So uh, did you, Susan, measure uh, cortex steroids by some chance? I have not, but Bernie, I think it's Bernie Halloran's lab, has measured that some years ago, glucocorticoid response. And they did find an elevation in the first two to three days, as I remember. Acute. And mm -hmm. it is a model of restraint stress. But if you allow that animal to adapt over time, within three, four days, they're grooming normally. And, and I, 
I believe Halloran's lab or, um, verified that over time, after five days or later, those glucocorticoid levels reduced. So I will not deny there's some stress to the animal in the first few days, um, but with careful animal care, um, they, they, uh, I think those stress levels are reduced and glucocorticoids are low. Thank you. And um, uh, the second question, uh, would you believe that the grip strength model or this stimulated uh, muscle response model in anesthetized animal uh, can be used uh, by human studies as a you know, ah. model of our grip strength or Yeah, maximal. interesting question. Uh, actually, um, there are models. Um, um, there's functional electrical stimulation using surface electrodes. Um, I actually used that years back in a spinal cord injury model. Um, but there you have to deal with the practical limitations of, as it's very difficult to use in a fully sensate individual, it's quite uncomfortable. <laughs> so we were able to use it with complete spinal cord injury because of course there was no sensation. Um, I'm not aware, I'm, I know there are folks in rehabilitative science who use functional stimulation for various protocols, but I'm not aware that you can generate comfortably strong enough contractions to really prevent disuse bone loss, but I'd love to hear from anyone in the audience who knows more about this area. Thank you. Thank you. Jessica Scott, Johnson Space Center. I have a, we're showing that high intensity exercise actually prevents all of the declines in muscle, bone, and cardiovascular function in space flight and bed rest. So, I was very surprised at the low intensity vibration works so well, and I was wondering if you've looked at that in animal models, high intensity exercise to prevent all of these declines. Well, the intensity of the muscle contraction protocols we're using is fairly high. We tested both 100% intensity relative to peak isometric torque as well as 75%. And this protocol is, is provides not just, it just abolishes the bone loss. Um, it's not as successful, interestingly, with muscle. But this is fundamentally different from, um, in some ways, from live humans exercising with voluntary exercise, right? Because it's a conscious animal, it's a voluntary activity, you have an integrated metabolic response, right, as well as the local mechanical effects. So um, um, we have not tested vibration in the context of hind limb unloading, but I do believe Clint's lab has. So I'll leave yeah, him um, to answer so, that. So, so we have actually done tail suspended uh, rats and mice uh, and exposed them either to sham loading for you know 10 minutes per day, letting them down and run around, and also while they're running around on a buzzing plate. And we're able not only to, to um, suppress the loss of bone, we have not actually looked at muscle in, in, those, in those models, but actually show in reambulation that the buzzed animals actually recover more quickly. Uh, we have, as I showed in the, the bed rest trial with postural uh, stability, we were also looking at bone loss and we were unable to show any influence uh, of the buzzing on bone. I mean, the, the loss was profound in, in you know, 90 days of bed rest and nothing we did influenced it. The postural stability was really the, the principal positive outcome. Um, I think it basically uh, screams out the difficulty of going from a mouse or a rat to a human. I mean, just, it's a tough translation. Right. Can, can I add one comment? Um, if you're referring to the data Scott Smith just published, um, Maybe you were referring to other data that hasn't yet been published out of the Johnson Space yeah, Center. Yeah, this is with Lori's lab, looking yeah. at the very, very high intensity exercise. Well, I know, at least in Scott Smith's data set, on more recent crew members who've had access to the advanced resistance exercise device, the improved hardware, and able to achieve higher intensities. Another important component um, that was different from earlier crew members was that they were achieving a much um, uh, or, or achieving better energy intake. So avoiding caloric restriction during spaceflight is absolutely key, I think, to maximizing those responses. And it's a non-sexy but very effective fix that right. I think we need to Thanks. recognize Thanks. that interacts with all these. Uh, next question. So to not compromise the next section or the posters, this will be our last question. So would you like to keep going? Okay, that's fine. All right. Uh, 
My question is for Dr. O'Keefe. Um, I'm Christina Olson from Thomas Jefferson University. I study traumatic spinal cord injury, and yes, I use some FES. Um, but how would you approach a patient who is about four months after spinal cord injury, is just getting up, who has heterotopic bone from the prolonged line, and is currently on, on my unit, COX-2 inhibitors, as well as etidronate, which is the standard of care. But he also has a vitamin D level of 9.8, uh, because he's been sitting in bed on some two feeds. And so the question is, how does one approach both treating the vitamin D deficiency at some point, perhaps not now, while you're treating the HO, and what is the body doing? Can it benefit from the other aspects of vitamin D, other health aspects of vitamin D, or am I completely canceling the effect of etidronate by attempting to give both? You know, that, that's, um, that's a really complex question. <laughs> and, I, and I actually see, I do metabolic bonus as well. Why don't we talk during the break? Okay. And um, I'll give that some thought uh, while we're thinking, while we're f finishing up this session. Okay. 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 Yeah, Gorski, Kansas City. I had a question for uh, Clint. Uh, with respect to the uh, talk, I think it was a very interesting uh, presentation. Thank you. Um, the, and you talk us through whole, whole animal type studies and then back to cell culture, uh, uh, buzzing individual cells and cell populations. Is the take home message that you'd like us to take home from this is that uh, your effects of the mechanical stimulation is really uh, a, uh, an effect which is on those stem cells directly? Or do you think that there is any intervention or interaction or cell signaling that's necessary in vivo between different populations? Or is this really something which the implication from looking at those cell studies at the end is all you need is the individual cells and, and the uh, stimulus? Um, it, it's a great question. I mean, I guess if, if you thought that was the take-home message, I wouldn't argue with it. But I think that my point was actually to make sure that people consider cells that we don't typically consider. I mean, we in the, in the bone world and, and in the muscle world tend to stick with muscle cells and bone cells. And the idea that you know, where, where we're going with this is looking not only at the mesenchymal, uh, you know, the progenitor population, but also those that are affecting the immune system. And I guess it goes back to the question yesterday, what is the target cell population? And you know, the funny thing about gravity and acceleration of mechanical signals is it's hard to avoid. And essentially, all cells are subject to it as you're sort of rambling around and moving around. Um, you know, fish without osteocytes are subject to, you know, accelerations and decelerations. So I, I guess my take home message wa would be that uh, mechanical signals are critical growth factors to physiology. I would like to muddy the waters a little bit uh, for Susan uh, may, and make a suggestion. I, I've been on a committee for the last 20 years uh, formed by the National Academy of Sciences to provide some oversight in the uh, biomedical research programs for NSBRI and, uh, and NASA. And uh, if you look at the reports of that committee, you'll see that recommendations for research 20 years ago were completely ignored in, in, in the 10-year follow-up. None of the things that had been suggested were, had been done. And now we just review it again last year, the, the next 10-year report. Still, none of this had been done. So now I'm going to appeal to you personally. And, and, and <laughs> here, here's the dilemma. We're no longer considering the issues of the International Space Station. And the shuttle program is done. But NASA is preparing to embark on longer term missions to, well, whether it's an asteroid or Mars, it's, it remains to be seen. But in fact, it has been a Mars program all along. If you talk to the people at NASA, you know, kind of informally over a beer. But the, what is going to have to happen, first of all, they're going to have both men and women astronauts. And they are very concerned about the 
ambient exposure to ionizing radiation once you get out of even the you know, distance to the moon. And so what they plan on doing is having all the women be on Depot Provera. That had, I've seen that in several reports over 20 years. So recognizing that none of the countermeasures so far have really been protective of bone and recognizing that there will be a, like a, well, let's face it, it's going to take two years to get to Mars and you don't just eat and run. You stay there for a while and then you come back. It's a, a bunch of time for women who will be functionally menopausal. It seems to me important that if you're going to be doing some animal models of microgravity, be they hind, hind limb sus suspension or other models, you should put into that the ophorectomized rat because that's going to be more realistic to what you're going to be facing. I, that's the first point I want to make. The second thing is, I, I was a little surprised by a statement that you made that there's no, there's no way of assessing bone quality directly outside of, you know, in, in vivo. And in the 1990s, uh, a, a, um, an electronic engineer at uh, Stanford University, Charles Steele, developed a technique which was used in several laboratories, including my own and including the NASA Ames uh, laboratories uh, under Sarah Arno, which would allow, it, was a, it was an ultrasound probe that you could apply either to the forearm or to the tibia, which would give you, the, it would be a measure of the bone stiffness. You could get Young's modulus and you can get the um, moment of inertia of those bones and make some statements about you know, fundamental properties, uh, both mineral and, and structural properties of the bone. And as that machinery got more and more refined and the variability got better and better, unfortunately it was sold off to a company who then took it away from all the investiga university investigators who were trying to develop it. And I honestly, and I think that company went under. Do you under. know where it is? I have no idea where it is, but it is, but it was actually becoming a quite a reliable tool. And I would just, you know, offer for your, for your well, interest, the possibility of trying to find, find the people it. who were involved and, and, and to get that. Because it, it, it is a direct way of looking at something fundamental about bone that you, you don't need to get a biopsy for. That, that's a good point. I'm glad you bring it up. Um, it, it, it just, and you're right though, it hasn't been around for some years. Um, I'm not sure, I'm not familiar with the data that have perhaps validated that and say against cadaveric bone specimens to actually measure stiffness directly. So I was being literal that to measure it directly, we can't do it. We can't break the bone, you can't excise the bone from your human subjects. But that was an interesting approach at measuring it um, non-invasively. Um, with bone that's close to the surface, right? That you had very little um, over um, soft tissue overposed and so forth. Um, it's very interesting. I had not heard um, from NASA colleagues about this plan to give Depo Provera to all women astronauts on long duration missions. And it would appear to be ill advised um, because you certainly don't want to impose low circulating estrogen on the response. And there have been studies combining ovariectomy with hind limb unloading and shows profound bone loss. So I'm not, that doesn't make intuitive sense. Um, but you're right, it would, there is a dearth of data on gender specific adaptations. Um, uh, there was a call a year ago for that very topic, but very few of those studies were funded. Um, and it's a clear need. Um, and you also raise the impact of the added impact of radiation. And uh, I, I'm, th my lab has been actively involved in the last four years, as well as three or four others, in looking, um, including Ruth Globus at the NASA Ames Research Center, on looking at the combined effects of radiation and unloading, which is very important because now you're looking at um, impact even at low dose radiation but with high energy particles on um, stem cell populations, on profound effects on, on bone that are quite surprising for the low doses involved. So there's a lot of work yet to be done if we're going to support any human presence in space. 